please welcome Laura Perry Smaltz. Uh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really glad to be here, and I, I love to be able to share what God has done in my life. And it's interesting, as, as John was sharing, how much this has changed over the last few years. Uh, when, I was a, when I was a child, I had never even heard the word transgender. I really didn't even find out what a transgender was until I was 25, looking up on Google, girl becoming a boy, just to like, has anybody ever thought of this? And uh, even years later, when I detransitioned in 2016, I still had heard of very few girls that had transitioned. This has completely blown me away as well as how this has taken our girls by storm. And I think one of the reasons is because of the influence of other people. And the reason this topic is so important, because it's not just about the one person who believes this, it's about the influence they have on so many other people. Um, and you know, we always hear that my sin only affects myself, but it's not true. And as, as John said, ideas have consequences. In fact, that stuck out to me as well because a man that had an enormous influence on my life, a man named Dr. Everett Piper, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with him. Uh, he's from my home state of Oklahoma. But um, he often quoted that and talked about the, uh, that ideas have consequences and these ideas lead somewhere. And it's true in my own story and it's true in this culture as well. And that's why this, this conversation is so important. So when I, was a, when I was a little kid, I was raised in a Christian home. I was raised in um, a, a good loving family. You know, and I didn't understand the, I didn't understand the gospel even though I heard about Jesus all the time and we were involved in every little program at the church, and I went to Christian school, but I really didn't understand the gospel. But um, my, my parents were doing the best they could, but the enemy began to sow a lot of lies, and I began to believe it. And it, there was this, um, in my life, but in many other lives I've seen, there's this dual-sided coin of people who have been sinned against, but we respond in sin. And I think sometimes we, we look at these you know, uh, at our little children that seem so innocent, and yet we are all born with a sinful nature. And even as a five-year-old, I can remember being intensely jealous of my brother because he had a very different relationship with my mom. Uh, I saw the way that she treated him, and I, I would try to act more like my brother. I would try to play with his toys and wear his clothes. But I didn't know the pain my mom was experiencing among all the stress and all the, um, the things that she was going through just in daily life that I didn't understand because... I didn't find out until after I got married that parenting is hard. <laughs> I got a, got a stepson. <laughs> but, that, but, you know, I, so a child doesn't have that perspective. But I also didn't know that my mom had lost two boys to miscarriage between my brother and I. So she was in this deep, incredible grief, and she would cling to my brother. And I would overhear her sometimes talking about how much she loved my brother. And, but I was always talked about, like, you know, Laura's so annoying. She has, she's such a handful. She talks too much. You know, go figure that I talk too much as a child. But, but, but the reality was my mom was just frustrated and I really was very hyper. I demanded a lot of attention in my own sinful heart that was always trying to get attention in the wrong ways. And rather than talking to mom, my mom about how I felt, rather than trying to understand her side of the story, I began to blame her. I began to get angry and bitter toward her. And I began to cut her off and I began to build emotional walls. And you know the, nobody knew how much I was struggling inside. But the Bible warns us in Proverbs, it says that he who builds a high gate invites destruction. You know, and it's, um, and it, um, I made inner vows like I will never be like my mom or I will never let her hurt me again. And over seemingly innocent things, she had no idea I was feeling this way. And I think so often this happens with, um, I've, I've talked to so many parents who had no idea that their children had um, things against them, and a lot of times they don't know how to talk about what's hurting them, and they keep it all bottled up inside. And so that's what I was doing. And in fact, the, the Lord reminded me that when we build these emotional walls, if, if, if in the ancient days, if a, if a city was being attacked by the enemy, and they could close up their walls and gates, and then the enemy just lays siege outside, and the, pers the people on the inside just starved. And that's what's happening to these, these kids so often is that they're hurt and they don't know how to talk about it and those wounds just stay inside. And so there's all, there, this, uh, so much of transgenderism is based out of trauma and things like that, but it may not be the trauma that we're necess um, necessarily used to. It may not seem as traumatic to, to you and I, but 
remember that we are all created for the Garden of Eden. God created us for a world that was perfect, that had no sin, no war, no disease, nothing wrong with our bodies, and a child does not understand that this world is broken. And one thing the Lord has taught me is that, because I used to hear so many young people um, all the time, I used to hear them talking so much about living their authentic life and seeking authenticity, and this became a big buzzword. And I began to ask the Lord, why are these kids so attracted to this idea of authenticity and living a real life? And I realized it's because they have grown up on nothing but technology, and they're not seeing, I hear from so many, they're not seeing realness in the church and among their parents, and we all act like we have this perfect image, and we have it all together because we don't want to share our pain with anybody. We don't want anybody to know we're struggling, and they're struggling inside, and they know they're broken, and they're going on YouTube and TikTok and hearing how broken these lives are, and they're, and, but those people are giving them a false salvation, and they're saying, it's because I was transgender. That's the reason I was so broken, but now I'm not broken because I've embraced my authentic self. So I didn't have that when I was a kid, but I'm seeing that in mass numbers now because the people on YouTube and TikTok are being more real about their lives than we are. We don't talk about our struggles. We don't talk about the pain in our lives. We want everybody to think we have this perfect image. And in fact, people, and that was true of my family, in fact, when I, when I uh, detransitioned and people began to hear my story, people were shocked because they thought we were the perfect family and we didn't have any problems. And that's a problem in the church. And we have to get back to being real. But, I, you know, but as a result, I kept all this inside, and bitterness and envy and jealousy began to um, breed in my heart. And then I was sexually molested at eight years old by another boy, introduced a lot of sexual confusion. Um, and because this was another boy that was my age, he was my friend's brother, um, I, it, this wasn't some big, older, scary man. You know? And so it, it, rather than making me afraid, it actually opened up a lot of curiosity and a lot of shame because I knew this was wrong, began experimenting with other kids. And I, but I was at the same time building so much bitterness and anger toward my parents. In Hebrews 12, 15, and 16 warns us, it says, looking diligently, lest any man fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up to cause trouble, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. And what that's telling us is that bitterness leads to defilement and ultimately to sexual sin and then throwing everything they know about the faith out the window for what they want in the flesh. That's exactly what happened to me. It's what I see happen to so many young people who are raised in the church. They know the truth. I've talked to many LGBT who say, I knew the truth the whole time. Romans 1 also tells us the same picture. It says, you know, that many of us are familiar with the progression of Romans 1 where people are given over to lust and then unnatural lust, eventually to a mind that completely rejects the truth. But a, lot, but a lot of us don't realize where that starts. It says God has revealed himself to every man so that they are without excuse. It says they glorified him not as God, neither gave thanks to him, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish hearts were darkened. They professed themselves to be wise, but they became fools and they ch exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They were not thankful. This is huge. They're because so often they're angry and bitter about their circumstances. In fact, years ago, I, um, I watched hundreds and hundreds of testimonies one weekend because I got sick, and I had committed to the Lord for that week of all weeks that I was not going to watch any TV or movies, and then I got the flu, and I couldn't do anything. <laughs> and so I literally watched about five or 600 testimonies on CBN, and God taught me an incredible amount about the way he works in people's lives. And one of the most profound things I learned was that in almost every case, there was some form of this question, maybe not the exact words, but something to the effect of, if God is good, why did he allow this in my life? And that's when they begin to turn away from the faith. And on the flip side of that, Romans 2.4 tells us it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. And so it's doubting God's goodness that begins to turn us away. But when God begins to reveal his goodness is what turns us back to the Lord. And so as I, but as a young teenager, I was angry and bitter. I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome when I was uh, 14, and they told me I had a doctor very flippantly to a 14-year-old girl. Of course, even though I didn't like being a girl, remember, I had no idea about being transgender. That was not even on my radar. So I, I still wanted to be able to have a family and everything one day. And this doctor very flippantly says, somebody's going to have a hard time getting pregnant. 
And I really began to believe at that age that I was never going to have children. And this lie began to come into my heart that I was never going to be good enough to be a wife. No man was ever going to want to marry a, a girl that couldn't have children. Um, I, as a result, I was desperate for men to validate me, to give me affection, to give me value and worth. So I got into an enormous amount of sexual sin with, with anybody that would pay attention to me, guys I didn't even like. Um, but I was so desperate for that value and that affirmation and I didn't realize that my own sexual sin was destroying me. I thought God didn't want me to have fun, but God was actually protecting me, and I didn't understand it. I was sowing so much sexual sin. Into I thought that went out. Did it? Okay. Oh, it just got bent. Okay. But I was sowing so much sexual sin into, the, um, into my own heart, and I was the one. I used to get so mad at these men because I was used, abused, and rejected, and dumped over and over again, and I used to blame them, but I realized that Okay, do you want me to turn them? Are they going to turn off? No? Turn? Testing? Okay. All right. Um, but I didn't realize that, you know, they. I used to blame them for so much. But the Lord began to reveal to me that I was the one telling them I had no worth or value. And so many of our young people are in so much sexual sin. They've been exposed to pornography at such young ages. And I know these lifestyles look innocent when they're glamorized in the media. But I have never met, I'm, there may be some, but many of them I met, I'll, I'll say this way, many of them I met have been in deep sexual sin and pornography. But it was like uh, the Lord gave me an analogy this summer as uh, my husband and I had a garage sale and I, we had a table. Uh, well, actually, we at the end of the day, we wanted to get rid of this stuff and all this stuff that we didn't want. We're hoping somebody, it, like if nobody takes it, it's going in the trash kind of stuff. And we put out this table that was marked free, just take it. And that's what I was doing to myself giving myself away. I didn't understand how, God's God, how good God's design was. But as a result of all this sexual sin, I began to feel like I had no worth or value. And I began to hate myself with a really intense hatred. I felt like I would never be good enough to be a wife. And I, re I decided that the reason that I felt that way was because um, I was supposed to be a man. If I was a man, I know how I would treat a woman. And I began to fantasize about it night and day until I finally decided that's who I was supposed to be. And I, I looked up on Google, like I said earlier, I found a support group in Tulsa, and I went, and within five minutes, they were like, oh, you are definitely transgender. It's like, I knew it, I knew this was me. This makes sense, my whole life makes sense. And I began to reinterpret my, li my entire life through that lens. And I began to come up with all these little things that would, um, that would justify that. But I didn't realize and I, I thought it would never look like a, a man. I was worried about that. And they said, oh, don't worry about it. After a year or so of taking hormones, no one will ever know you were a girl. And that's what I'd wanted all my life. And it's like, I can erase this person that has so much pain. I can erase Laura and completely reinvent myself. I can become a new person. And I didn't think it through. I didn't understand the biology or the science of it. I really just believed that I could become this other person. And I had so many, my parents never compromised on the truth, but I had so many other people that did, and people that affirmed me, and people thought this was great, and celebrated me, and called me by this new name, and affirmed me as this man, and it started me down a dark road. In fact, I, I had to go to a therapist, um, and I was not interested in counseling at all, but I was required to go to a therapist in order to get diagnosed with gender identity disorder so that I could then um, get the hormones that I was wanting. And during the third session, she put down her notebook and she stopped it was like she stopped for a minute she looked right in my eyes and she said wow you really have issues with your mom and she was broken for me and I had never made the connection I didn't understand because I had buried it for years I didn't realize that I still had all this anger toward my mom that she never deserved but again I didn't have her perspective I had never talked to her about her own brokenness all I had was all this bitterness and anger toward my mom and this kind of came out in this session. And I said, I am not here to talk about my mom. And she said, so you just want this diagnosis? I said, yes, that's all I'm looking for. And she said, okay. And she just gave me what I wanted. You know, and too often we are so um, quick to tell people what they want to hear because we don't want to hurt people's feelings. But if we're really honest, it's because we don't want them to say bad things about us. The Lord told me one time as I was praying about this, and the Lord said there's an idolatry of, in the church of wanting to be loved by the world, of wanting the world to say that's the most loving church, that is the most loving Christian I know. And some people will say that, 
And of course we want to we want to speak truth in love always. But the enemy's no, one of the enemy's number one tactics is to make us feel like we're hateful Christians, like we're not being loving enough. But Jesus said that we would be hated. In fact, he said, be, woe to you when all men speak well of you. He said, if they reject my message, they're going to reject yours. Jesus said many people walk away from him. But we don't know how many of those came back. We know that um, many times the seeds take time to grow. And I've had people come and reject me initially and come back later and thank me for what I said. But as I went into that lifestyle and I began to take so many of the hormones and my voice began to get lower and began to grow body hair and facial hair and I began to have this more masculine appearance. And it seemed to be real at first. And then a, a couple of years later, I had a double mastectomy so I could have a more masculine chest. And when that still didn't fix the problem, because I realized that that surgery didn't make me a man. And I felt devastated and stupid. And I thought, women have mastectomies all the time for medical reasons. This didn't make me a man. But it was confusing because this surgery made me legally male. And I was able to take a letter from my surgeon uh, to... Uh, to the birth records, but the vital records in Oklahoma, and get my birth certificate changed to say that I had been born male. And I knew it wasn't true. And I thought, why is this still not real? Why is this dysphoria not gone away? And so I began, I, I thought, well, it's because I still have all these female organs. Once I have all these female organs removed, then it will be real. So I had um, a hysterectomy, and I had the ovaries removed. And when that still didn't fix the problem, I was devastated. And I thought, at what point does this become real? And I started looking at the, the genital reassignment surgeries, they call it. And I had never realized how fake these surgeries are. This is not real. This is not Mrs. Potato Head. We can't pop on and pop off parts. It is, a, it, it is an artificial facsimile a fake representation of what should be there. And in fact, there are endless complications. I have heard of so many different complications and horror stories of people that have had these surgeries that are maimed for life. I know of a girl that ended up in a wheelchair. I know um, ones that have had like tissue necrosis where it just dies. Um, men that have had all kinds of um, urinary problems and um, problems with it, atrophying um, and lots and lots of other problems. This is not real, and this is not good. And this started with an idea. This started with me believing that this would solve my problems. We forget what this is going to look like down the road. But as I, as I was so desperate, and I really became very suicidal, and I was very empty, and I was very broken, and I remember w pacing around my apartment thinking, you know, I have everything I've ever wanted. I have this identity I want. Everybody thinks I'm a man. I have this, uh, this job where I'm only known as male. And I thought, I'm still just going to work and paying bills. This hasn't, this hasn't made my life any better, really. So, like, so what if everybody thinks I'm a man? And I thought, there's got to be more to life than this, but it's not Christianity because I grew up in that. I didn't understand the truth of the gospel. I didn't understand that I had never really known Christ. I didn't know that I'd never been filled with the Spirit of God. And so I, I grew up in religion. Even though I'm sure I was surrounded by it, my, my eyes had been blinded by it, or blinded to it. But the Lord began to pursue me, and he'd actually been pursuing me for years. There were so many things I heard over radio, so many things that I heard, uh, testimonies and different things, and people just talking about God once in a while. At first it was very political, and so they would just talk about God once in a while. It was very conservative. But over the years, God was speaking to me, and God was drawing my heart, and my parents had been praying. And in the meantime, while I was out doing all these things, my parents had really surrendered me into the Lord's hands. And they began to radically pursue Jesus. And as they did, God began to transform them. And as my parents got transformed, God began to open my eyes to what he was doing in them. And one day after months of talking to my mom, which I had been very distant from her for a long time, but she asked me to make a website for a Bible study. And as I did, I started. That's a long story in itself. She's, she, people thought she like figured out how she was going like, to get me to read the Bible. She's like, I had tried for years, and I'd given up. I just needed the website. But it was, I was the one that started reading the lessons because I was going to summarize them for the website. But I got curious, and I started calling and asking her questions. And she said, uh, and as I did, 
I began seeing a change in my mom. And I began seeing that my mom was not the same mother I grew up with. In fact, I said, Mom, you're not the mother I grew up with. What's happened to you? And she began to tell me how she'd been changed by the Holy Spirit. And it was at that moment when I realized that my mom had something I didn't have. It was at that moment I knew the gospel was true. And I knew that Christ was alive because I could see his transforming power in her. And I went home that night, and I began to pour out my heart to God, and I began to confess everything I could ever think of, and I began to cry out to the Lord with all my heart. And I, um, it was actually a couple of days later as I wrestled with the Lord over a couple of days because I felt so unworthy and so dirty. And I, didn't, I still didn't understand until I had this incredible encounter with the Lord where he proved he was not done with me yet and that he wanted me after everything I had done. And I completely surrendered my life to him. I got radically saved to the point I, I was so transformed. I called my mom to tell her what happened. She knew just from that phone call that I had been changed. She said I sounded so different. I was never the same. But I thought I was going to be a man of God because I had already transitioned. I mean, I was legally male. I had all this facial hair. I had a lot of body. I had, you know, I had my breasts removed. Like, I just didn't see how I could possibly go back. This is a one-way street. I'd never even heard. I'd heard of one person leaving the life cell. But I really had not heard a lot about detransition. I, was, I just thought, Lord, I'm just going to be a man of God. But I, one night I was so desperate for the Lord because I knew the Lord had called me into ministry. And I kind of threw myself on the floor and I said, God, I want everything you have for me. I don't want to miss anything. What do you want from me? And I heard the Lord ask me, he said, if you stood before me tonight, what name would I call? And I had heard the Lord calling me Laura in my prayers. And I didn't like it. I was trying to ignore that. But he said, he reminded me of John chapter 1 where it says, Jesus Christ himself is the creator. He said, you cannot claim to love me and yet reject my creation. And I thought I was being condemned because I was not going to go back to being Laura. But in the most loving voice I've ever heard in all my life, he whispered to me and he said, let me tell you who you are. And that's really what began to change me. It wasn't at that moment. It's not like at that moment I went, oh, yes, God, I want to be a woman. There was so much pain there. I could not even conceive of being a woman again. And in fact, for a couple of months, I really begged the Lord with all my heart to just take my life because I saw no way out. I said, I can't do this. And I found myself in this deep, dark pit I couldn't get out of. And I could see the light at the top, but there was no way out. And I knew the Lord was asking me to leave this lifestyle. And he reminded me of Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26. that says, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever will save his life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his own soul? Or what shall he give in exchange for his soul? And I had a clear vision of Jesus Christ getting down on one knee, and he reached his hand down in this pit, and he asked me, do you trust me? And he was asking me to just walk away from it all, leave it all behind, and come and follow me. And see, the problem is in this culture is that our, our young people are being taught to embrace themselves, to live their authentic life, and all of these terms that are all about self and what self wants. When Jesus calls us to deny ourselves, but in exchange, he will give us a much better life than we can ever conceive of. I had no idea the amazing life that God had for me and the healing that he would bring. You know, I'm so grateful the Lord didn't leave me there. It was the hardest thing I've ever done to walk away from it all, to walk away from that identity and the lifestyle that I had worked so hard for, that I had given so much money and time in my body for everything I'd believed in for so long. And I walked away from a partner I'd had for, I called him, we were both trans, I called him my wife for, um, for eight years. And the Lord asked me to just walk away, leave it all behind and come and follow me. The hardest thing I've ever done. But as I did, the Lord began to heal me as I began to forgive my mom, as I began to reconcile with my parents, as I began to forgive others that had hurt me, as I began to repent of my own sin, as I began to embrace the truth. And I remember intentionally replacing the lies with the truth of Scripture. No, I don't, no matter what I feel, I'm going to stand on the word of God. Because the, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God will stand forever. I don't care what this culture says. The word of God is still true, and it's still relevant today. And it was piercing to my heart. And as God began to heal me, and he began to um, bring this love and this desire 
of how he created male and female, and I began to study the difference between male and female and how God created And it started with just questions. I started asking God, why do you care if I identify as male or female? What does it matter? What does it even mean to be male or female? And God began to give me a vision of uh, traveling around the country and sharing this and teaching about God's design of male and female with a husband. And I didn't have a husband on the radar. <laughs> I'd not even met a guy I was interested in. Uh, but about a year later, God brought this incredible man into my life. Uh, this, we were married uh, about two years ago. His name is Perry. So his first name is also my maiden name. So <laughs> get kind of confused. But he is an amazing man. And uh, I am so incredibly grateful now on the other side of this that I see, yes, I understand the pain. I understand how much they want to be this way. I understand how real it can seem for a while to live as a, a, a trans person and all these changes are happening and, and this seems like it's going to make them happy. Everything is fun for a season. But when that fades away, it's like a drug that no longer gives you a high. But the Lord has transformed my heart and he's given me an incredible life and now um, able to, um, now fulfilling the vision that God gave me. Uh, my husband and I have just recently started, uh, a couple of months ago, started our own ministry called Eden's Redemption um, our heart in this really is to glorify what God created, that his design of male and female is good. His design of human beings is good. Yes, we're all under the curse of sin, but God is redeeming all of us. All of those that will trust in Christ can be part of his redemption plan. And ultimately, not only to restore us, but also um, that there will be a new heaven and a new earth and that one day we will be out of the pain and suffering of our bodies. Because in this broken world, we will have suffering. There are many things. All of us have things we hate about our bodies, especially as we get older, um, and which I'm discovering. But one day, we are going to be in a perfect world again, the world that God created us for. And we will live forever and reign forever with him. And so that's the message that we want to share with others. And we want others to know the transforming power of Christ that he can transform a life beyond anything we ever imagined. And so I, I remember this, uh, I'll close with this. The, um, I used to pray for a man named Penn Gillette. I don't know if anybody's familiar. He had an act in Vegas. I used to love Penn and Teller years ago. And um, I just remember praying for him one day. And I, at one point I thought, you know, God, this big celebrity has all the money in the world. Why would he ever come to Jesus? And I just began to doubt. And I, I saw a YouTube clip one day. And a man that he knew that he worked with had shared with a Bible with him. And he said in years he had worked in the, the um, entertainment industry. He said, I've known many Christians and not one Christian had shared their faith with him and until this guy did many years later. And he said, how much do you have to hate someone to know that you have the keys to eternal life and not share the truth with them? We've got to get bolder. We've got to get more courageous and stop worrying about what somebody's going to say now because I had, a, I had one guy hang up on me and tell me he was never going to talk to me again because he didn't like what I was saying, even though I always spoke in love. And he came back to me 11 months later. He had had this incredible encounter with the Lord. And he said, thank you for sharing what, or saying what you said. So thank you so much. I'm going to invite. Well, I hope you have found this discussion not only inspiring, but also informative. Christians have to be able to think, especially in this constantly changing culture, from a Christian worldview. To learn more and to find more discussions, please visit lighthousevoices.org. That's lighthousevoices.org.